Do you believe in predictions? Maybe you do or maybe you don't. Actually, there are things which can make you believe some of them, not each one of them, but maybe just some. There is nothing wrong with it, as some people actually are skilled enough to make people know their future or making the predictions, and so is the case with the very well-known one Nostradamus, a person who was believed to be a French apothecary and a very reputed seer. All about Nostradamus Though he is well known by the people around, but there are some people out there who don't really know about him, and so to make everyone know, here it is. Nostradamus, whose actual, or you can say full name, is Michel de Nostradam, was one of those reputed seers who published plentitude of prophecies which became famous in the whole wide world among which the book named as Le Prophetes made him entirely famous all over the world. According to many of those great sources, he is believed to be born on either 14th or 21st of December 1503 in saint remy de provence Provence, France. Also, his known siblings included Delphine, Jean, Hector, Pierre, Louis, Bertrand, Jean II and Antoine. There is not that so much information about his childhood, but according to some reports, there was some tradition according to which he was educated by his maternal grandmother. Walking over the teenage years, he was at that age of 15 when he entered that University of Avignon to aspire his degree of bachelorette after a year of which he was forced to leave the place as university closed all of the doors due to some outbreak there and then after which he travelled countryside for eight long years from the year 1521, carrying out that research on natural remedies that can help people out in several ways. In year 1529, after spending some years in apothecary, he went forward to join the University of Montpellier to approach studies in medicine field where he was banned afterwards due to his history as being apothecary, though later he was called as a doctor by his publishers and correspondents. Then, in 1531, he was invited by Jules Caesar Scaliger to visit Aigon where he got married to a woman named as Andriette Dencoz, from whom he got two children who, along with his wife, died in 1534 due to plague, which was the only reason to get him out of that area when he joined over the university to complete his graduation. After his family died, he continued to travel finding over that solution which can get people over this disease, and thus which can bring them relief. And then, as he returned back in 1545, he helped Louis Serre, one of those prominent physicians who was already looking over the solution on how to cope up with plague breakdown in Marseille, after which he himself tackled with a problem in areas like Salon de Provence and A en Provence. Moving forward to then, he finally settled in Salon de Provence, only with his wife who he got married in 1547 to the rich widow named Anne Ponsard, and they got six children together, among which three were girls and three were boys. Between the years counting 1556 and 1567, he and his wife attained on thirteenth of their share in one giant canal project which was controlled and structured by Adam de Crapon to moist and mostly dehydrated Salon de Provence from the river Durance. After his another visit to Italy, Michel began to focus on other field which was far away from medicines and which took him towards the world of deep mysteries. He also wrote an almanac for the first time in 1550 which brought him some good amount of success and so he decided to write some more of such books. It is believed that all of those books a total contained 6,338 number of prophecies and 11 annual calendars, some of which were starting with January the 1st and some from March as on the basis of believing. His book Almanac also brought him number of clans from worldwide so as to ask him about their horoscopes and also for different physics solutions, though in which he mostly failed as he expected his clans to bring their birth charts rather than making them himself like any other professional astrologer actually do. 
He actually made an attempt to try this himself on the base of the available tables, but ended up making errors, and thus which made him go unsuccessful in adjusting the statistics for his customer's place or time of birth. After this failure, he started working on the project of writing over a book that he already decided to work on, which also contained those undated prophecies, most of which made him famous nowadays among people. And this book, due to some problems, was published in three installments, among which the third one was not that famous and thus failed to make any place out there. Some people, while the book titled as Le Prophetes published, got that mixed reaction which made people think that Nostradamus was an employer of evil, a fake, or some, insane. There were also some of the great admirers of him, among which one was the wife of King Henry II, named as Catherine the Medjis, who after reading his first book, i.e. Almanacs, for 1555, which generally provided a hint on some unidentified dangers to the royal family, invited Nostradamus to Paris so as to get hold of the thing explained and also to get the horoscopes for her children drawn. Though this was the time when Nostradamus feared that he would be killed, but to his surprise he was conducted as a counsellor and physician in ordinary to Queen's son, i.e. the young King Charles IX of France, and that too by the date of his death in 1566. There are also some of the reports according to which Nostradamus was scared of being mistreated for any kind of heresy by the investigation team, but this list only included the magic and not prophecy or astrology. After all of this, by 1566, the gout in his body got miserable and which made it impossible for him to survive any more seeing which he summoned his lawyer to draw up a will which contained that all of his property and crowns counting to 3,444 goes to his wife. Then, moving forward, on 1st of July, he finally concluded to his secretary named as Jean de Chavigny that he won't be alive next day, and which turned out to be true, as he was not alive any more the very next day. There were many of those predictions made by him. First famous prediction Great Fire of London Everyone of you must have already heard about this tragedy, which took place in late 1666 and flew many of people's living away along with it. This was also one of those predictions which was made by Nostradamus and hence proved out to be true. This tragedy is considered as one of those major fires which took place in the city of London, brushing through the various parts of this city. The fire lasted for four long days, from 2nd to 5th September, 1666. Though this fire got maximum of the city inside it covered consuming 13,200 houses, 87 parish churches and many of the buildings which were under city authority, but somehow did not reach the district of Charles II Palace and other slums in the area. Statistics of death rate is still found to be unknown, but it is believed that there was not so much loss of lives as there were only six people who were verified to be as dead. The main reason behind this is said to be that deaths of poor and middle-class people were not recorded at all and thus, which made these statistics too much small to count, it is also believed that heat of fire must have consumed the bodies of other people leaving not any kind of remains behind to be recognised. There was also one piece of pottery which was kept at the display in some museum of London whose melting rate made archaeologists note that the temperature of this whole fall must have reached to the degree of 1250 Celsius. This great fire is believed to be started at Bakery of Thomas Farrider on Pudding Lane at some time of midnight at 2nd September 1666 and speeded across whole of the city of London. To fight over this tragedy, the main technique that was applied by people was to create fire breaks which can stop this fire from spreading any further, but the step was delayed due to having not any confirmation from Lord Mayor of London, Sir Thomas Bloodworth. After the order for this step got confirmed at Sunday evening, the wind already converting this fire to fire storm defeated the steps 
and thus which took fire to those long and really long distances, and then finally on Monday to reach over at the heart of London, which was no way less than a threat to people all over. Also, as all this was happening, there were some rumours signifying that some foreigners are the main reason behind all this, and thus they are the only one which made this happen. These rumours made many of those homeless people go angry, and it made many of those foreigners face that street violence. Moving over, this fall on Tuesday spread it over most of the city, which also took that St. Paul's Cathedral inside, and thus got it destroyed. Firefighting efforts were on the stake, and thus, which finally brought up the wind because of two major factors, among which one was dying down of east winds, and other was gunpowder used at Tower of London that was helpful in creating those fire breaks, and thus it made the fire stop from spreading any further. This disaster proved out to be really bad for London and people living there, as it brought them a huge social and economic loss but somehow they managed to make up the city as perfect as it was before the tragedy of fire. Looking further over the history of London, it is believed that this city, in 1660, was considered as the largest city in Britain, which was having those half a million of people living there. It was also once called as that wooden, northern and inartificial, another name to unplanned, congestion of houses by John Evelyn, and also there was always a fear of the fire hazard, as it was being manufactured all with woods and also had so much crowd over there. And late after the tragedy in 17th century, the only area left with London was area bounded by City Wall and River Thames, which was much lesser than what London used to be earlier. And also now, this place was just a home to some 80,000 people, a strong downfall from previous data. If one looks over such hazards, it is not only about this 1666 fire which brought up damage to this place, but there were many more tragedies which happened there earlier, such as the very first one in 1632, after which the use of woods and other cheap materials was prohibited for years, but they started using it again, which again proved out to be not so good for people living there. The only main stone-built area which could be found in this city was the wealthy centre, where there were the mansions of many of those merchants and brokers, enclosed by an internal ring of that poor people community which was totally overloaded and whose every other inch of construction space was used to provide accommodations to the continuously growing population. People in there were so much crowded, and all with those sources which can prove as helpful to them in daily life including sources of heat, pollution and everything which can take the city more nearer to the hazard possibility and also the destruction. Moving over, in 1661, Charles II finally delivered a declaration saying about the forbidding of overhanging windows and jetties, but local government did nothing and disregarded the agreement. After that, Charles's next harsher note in 1665 notified of the threat of fire from the slightness of the streets, but this note was also not that much entertaining to people there, and thus it was also ignored by most of them. It is also noted according to various reports that London was occupied by lots and lots of black powder, and which can particularly be found at the riverfront. Also, most of this powder was left in the houses of private residents. It is said that five to six hundred tons of this powder was stored in the Tower of London. Due to those various time confrontation with fires, there was a community which was at home meant for handling all of those hazards related to fires, and they were known by the name of trained bands. They used to patrol the streets at night so as to keep an eye on any kind of hazard. There were many of those equipments which were ordered to people to keep at the terrace, so as to deal with any kind of fire hazard which included long ladders, axes, leather buckets and fire hooks which can be used for taking people out of the danger first and then deal with the fire. Though there were also some of the failures occurred while fighting with these fires which turned out to be dangerous for people living there, among which one was in 1632 when fire got so much dangerous that it seemed nothing but a death trap to people, as London Bridge, the only way to get out of there, was itself covered with houses and so the fire emerged all over the place. 
that most of the crucial thing which made it difficult for people to take any step towards protection was the narrow streets of the city. There are also some people who have their personal experience shared with people around in which they tell about how it all began and how did they and everyone get to manage all this among which one is Samuel Pappies and other is John Evelyn. Their diaries can make people know about what must have happened that day at the moment and how this all happened. Second famous prediction, Rise of Napoleon now, this is that second part of history which may be well known to many people out there, especially the ones connected too much to the history. This rise of Napoleon was also one of those predictions carried out by Nostradamus, which again turned out to be true. For ones who don't know about him, Napoleon Bonaparte, 15th of August 1769 to 5th of May 1821, was one of those military and political leaders who came into fame during that French Revolution and also he led many of those campaigns at the time of those revolutionary wars which proved out to be successful to him and his ruling. He is also known by the name of Napoleon I, being an Emperor of French from 1804 to 1814 and then again in 1815 and occupied Europe during the same. He has also been a constant winner of many of the wars which made it possible for him to build that big empire of himself until all of this collapsed down in 1815. Talking over his childhood, Napoleon was born in Corsica in the modest family which made him to join army and then while the revolution broke out in 1789 he was serving as an artillery officer in Army of France and as he returned to Corsica the only thing he wanted was to start some political career which took him to other greater heights. But as the thing didn't really work out so it brought him back to the military and thus also he ended up being a commander of the army of Italy. Then, at the age of 26, he initiated his first ever military campaign, which was against Austrians and also their Italian followers, which brought him nothing but victory and thus it made him confirmed as a hero of nation. Out of the whole thing, in 1798, he thought of leading a military expedition to the Egypt that proved out to be a facilitator to his career towards political powers. Also, in 1799, he engineered a coup which made him become that first ever consul in Republic. All of these victories and good things were making him to go further and try on something new which can be a rise to his career and life which made him go further and thus in 1804 he ended up being the first Emperor of French in 1804. There were some of the differences which were being carried upon between France and British since the date 1805. And now was the time to get this partition shattered which was at last brought in action as the result of which Napoleon got those crucial victories in the Ulm campaign and which was not in any way less than a historic achievement over Russia and Austria at the Battle of Austerlitz and this led to the dismissal of the Holy Roman Empire. After this, in 1806, the Fourth Coalition took up their arms in front of him because Prussia became concerned about rising French effect on the area. Now this was the time when Napoleon had to show over some action to get this problem solved and so he quickly knocked out Prussia into the clashes of Jena and Auerstedt. With these victories of the different rulings made it possible for him to have that great power of him manages people and also it made him grow that huge empire of his. However, there were also some of the downfalls which made him take those tough decisions as for example the one after that attack of the French from Russia in 1812 made him abandon the rule and his powers although after two years of the incident but at the end he did. He actually got back with the powers in 1815, fighting over those various campaigns which he believed would let him get back to his power, but to his disappointment nothing like that really happened and thus after a defeat at the Battle of Waterloo he finally decided to abandon all of his powers once again which led him to nowhere but at an island of St. Helena where he took his last breath at the age of 51. 
Among these eight children born to Carlo Bonaparte, 1746 to 1785, he was a lawyer by profession, and Letizia Romalino Bonaparte, 1750 to 1836, he was the second one, and his family had not that much money to be considered as rich in any respect. It is also said that a year before Napoleon took a birth, France attained Corsica from Genoa, Italy, which made him have that French name added to his last name. As a boy, he attended over the school in France, only where he got to learn that French language, and then he was headed towards the army. During those initial ages of the revolution, Napoleon was mostly on vacation from the military and home in Corsica, which allowed him to get associated with Jacobins, which included Augustine Robespierre, who was the brother of revolutionary leader Maximilien Robespierre, and also the main reason behind the reign of terror. Napoleon was also once house arrested for his links to the brothers soon after Robespierre chopped out from power. Looking towards his personal life about marriage and children, he got married to Josephine de Beauharnais, who was a stylish widow having two teenage children and six years older from Napoleon. In 1809, when there were no children, he decided to end the marriage so that he can look up for the new one, and the search finally ended over Maria Louis, who was a daughter of the Emperor of Austria. He married her in 1810, and which brought him a baby boy named as Napoleon Francois Joseph Charles Bonaparte, who later was known by the name of Napoleon II and also the King of Rome. In addition to this son from Marie, Napoleon also had many number of illegal children. Third famous prediction Adolf Hitler Every one of you must be very aware of this name, as obviously one can get to hear this name every now and then in many of those Hollywood movies, or it can also be heard where there is some wrong happening going on. Before moving any step forward, do note that this is also one of those famous predictions which were brought out by Nostradamus that proved out to be true at the end. Now, moving forward to his biography, Adolf Hitler was a German politician who is well known for his leadership with Nazi Party, also known as National Socialist German Workers' Party. He has also been a president of Germany for the time period of 1933 to 1945 where he served as a dictator for many time as he was in ruling. Also, some of his policies and acts gave rise to World War II and also the execution of genocides against the Jewish community, which also later on got famous by the name of Holocaust. His defeat in Horizon made him to commit suicide with his wife, Eva Brown, on April 30, 1945. Talking about his early stages of life and journey, he was born on April 20th, 1889, in Braunau am Inn, in Austria. There were six children to his parents, named as Alois Hitler and Clara Polzl, among whom he was the fourth one. As a child, he usually had to have clashes with his father, who was actually pretty much emotionally harsh, and this was mainly due to the reason of his having interest in arts for pursuing as a career. And then finally, he got completely disconnected from his family after the death of his younger brother, Edmund, in 1900. Along with all this, he rejected the authority of Austria-Hungary and instead of that, showed interest towards German nationalism, which also in future turned out to be that motivating force in his life. Then, in 1903, his father, Alios, died suddenly after two years of which Adolf's mother allowed him to get dropped out of school, and then when his mother died in 1907, he moved on to Vienna, and there he started working as a watercolour painter and a casual labourer. He also applied for getting admitted in Fine Arts Academy for two times, but rejected both of the times. And as he has no money with him to live in orphans or any kind of shelters, he had to take those homeless shelters, correct definition, to tough life. He later on also talked about these years and pointed them as that first experience which made him get face to face with discrimination thing. Moving forward, in 1913, he finally decided over to move to Munich and then at the occurrence of World War I, he applied to become part of German army and serve with the best and he was finally allowed in 1914 that too being an Austrian citizen. 
Though Hitler consumed most of his time away from those main front lines, he was available at a number of important battles and was injured at some of those. He was also adorned for bravery, which brought him the Iron Cross First Class and the Black Wound Badge. After experiencing that collapse in all of the efforts made in war, his patriotism for Germany got more passionate, though he was shocked with the surrender of Germany in 1918. And therefore, like any other German nationalist, he was also the one who believed that civilian leaders and Marxists deceived the German army. Now, as you look up for his leadership histories, after all that thing of World War I, as he returned to Munich, continued to work for military as an intelligence officer. As he was monitoring all of the activities of German Workers' Party, which were also known by the name of DAP, he embraced many of those nationalists which were under that anti-Semitic thing, and also he got to know the anti-Marxist ideas of the founder, which was named as Anton Drexler. After that, he also joined over this group of DAP in September 1919, following which the name of the group was changed to NSDAP, also known as National Sozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterparty, and which is also abbreviated for the word Nazi. The banner for this group, or part way, personally designed and maintained by Hitler, i.e. the one with swastika symbol placed in a white circle and having red background all over. Soon after some time, he started gaining fame for his speeches against Treaty of Versailles, opposing politicians, Marxists and Jews, which were all filled with criticism and malice. Then, in 1921, he finally replaced the chairman of party who was previously aligned to Drexler. His speeches finally attracted other people and thus people started following him, among whom the early followers were including army captain Anne Strom, the head of the Nazi paramilitary organization which played that great role for meetings and political opponents. Hitler was also being arrested in which he served for nine months and during which he dictated to his deputy Rudolf Hess about that first volume of Mein Kampf, also known as My Struggle. Finding over what have gave him a great rise in politics, it was nothing but the big rate of unemployment in Germany which gave him an opportunity in political affairs. And then, in 1932, as he fought over for presidency against Paul von Hindenburg, Hitler scored second position in both of the voting, as out of all he got 36% vote from the public at final rate, which brought him as the strong face for election community. This thing brought him so much profit as Hindenburg appointed him as a chancellor to promote the political balance, and which brought him much more close to where he wanted to reach. After, at the end, this position appointed to Hitler was being used by him as a chancellor to form a de facto legal dictatorship. And then, after some time as he continued to grow, there came a time when he finally got that complete control over the legislative and executive branches of government which made him and his party to embark on those remaining opposition's parties, but at the end of June, all other parties got banned and the only one which was ready to rile over is Hitler's Nazi party. In August 1934, when Hindenburg finally took his last breath, the cabinet decided to combine all of the powers with the chancellor and thus which made Hitler a head of state as well as the government and also he was the only formally named leader and chancellor by that time. Also, this gave him a power to become a supreme leader of army. And now, as you look towards his death and legacy, Hitler, in early 1945, got to realize that Germany was going to lose the war. On 29th of April 1945, in midnight, he got married to his girlfriend named as Eva Braun in some kind of small ceremony, and he was already being informed about the losing. So he, being afraid of getting into the hands of enemy, committed suicide on April 30th, 1945, and that too with his wife, Braun. Both of their bodies were taken out to some bombed-out area which was outside of Reich Chancellery, where they were finally burned. And then, after all of this happened, Germany finally surrendered to the Allies on May 7, 1945. The fourth famous prediction, World Trade Center. 
This tragedy of World Trade Center is something which is known to every other person, and the more important thing to be noticed here is that this was also one of those predictions made by Nostradamus that turned out to be true at last. Now, looking over the deep discussions, this tragedy took place on September 11th in 2001, the date which actually brought a great threat for people in United States, as there was not only this one tragedy, but three another which took place at different regions of United States as a result of the terrorist plans made by the Islamic terror group Al-Qaeda. This attack resulted into the loss of around 2,996 people's lives and also there were other 6,000 which were badly injured. So how does this whole actually brought into action? This was actually done using four of the airplanes as they were hijacked by 19 of the Al-Qaeda terrorists among which two planes, i.e. American Airlines Flight 11 and United Airlines Flight 175 were crashed over those north and south towers of World Trade Center to make it have a huge downfall as a result of which within the time of an hour and 42 minutes both of the towers collapsed, causing fire, and thus making other buildings in the complex go damaged. And on the other side, the other plane that was the third one, American Airlines Flight 77, was being crashed over the Pentagon located in Arlington County, Virginia, which led to the restricted breakdown of Pentagon's western side. And moving over, the last one, the fourth plane, i.e. United Airlines Flight 93, was directed towards Washington, D.C. in order to get it destroyed, but it got crashed over in the field only at Stony Creek Township, and that happened as the result of the passengers in the plane as they tried hard to fight over the hijackers and thus stop it from happening. All of this destruction caused by these attacks brought that huge loss to United States, which took them to the worst, no matter whether it be that World Trade Center which collapsed and took many other buildings with it, or that Pentagon attack which took that western part of building destructed. The main community which was all behind this whole tragedy was Al-Qaeda, that is the one which was operated by Osama bin Laden, the main person behind all the making and managing. Though, it is also believed that Osama at first denied of being linked with this tragedy in any way, which also led to the conspiracies that this whole thing has been brought in action in allowance of US government, but then later on, as he agreed on being the part of all this, all of the conspiracies took their seats down. Future Predictions for 2017 now, reading over those well-known predictions which are linked to our past, it is time that you look over those which you are going to deal with in your future, that is, in upcoming years, well, especially the 2017 that everyone is looking forward to welcome. Here are some of those predictions which are made by Nostradamus for the upcoming year 2017. Have a look. Merging of North Korea and South Korea According to those predictions, northern and southern region of Korea are believed to be getting merged as dictator of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, who is considered as more cruel and dangerous that his father is going to be dethroned next year. Kim Jong-un, since the death of his father, caused those dangerous crises which brought into action by testing a nuclear weapon and using it against America and South Korea. Use of Solar Power it is also said that by 2017, there will be a wider use of solar plants as this will help in saving the energy and also will bring that positive change to that any kind of climatic condition. Commercial Space Travel This is that real agreement, but it is believed that outside of orbital flights, things will convert into exponentially more difficult. Moon, asteroids and mining tasks are unlikely goals within the next two years. Wars due to global warming According to Nostradamus, there is some possibility of that huge problem which can also be said as hot wars due to deprivation of various useful resources and also global warming. Now, as far as the warfare goes, there is a huge possibility of terrorist or bio-attacks by people. Disappearing of Cloud Computing 
you all must be very much aware of the word cloud computing as this plays that very huge role in all of our lives as we are getting connected to the technology nowadays. Now, according to Nostradamus, it is believed that the word cloud will disappear from this term and the only thing that would be left alone will be computing. That is because most of the computers will basically be supposed to be done in cloud itself. Financial hardship in Italy In future, Italy would be considered as that epicenter of financial crisis and that is all because of those loans and unemployment that Italy would be facing in future. This will also make people interest getting shifted from Greece and Spain to Italy. Banking system in there will be totally in trouble and which will just be the tip of the huge problem that they are going to face in future. This whole thing will look up for sacrifices and that too not just from Italians but also those EU members. Along with these, there are many of the predictions which are made and not being mentioned here, as about 2015 it was being predicted that Obama will be the last president for US, though there is nothing we can say to comment over this thing. Now, at the end, the only thing which is left to say is among all of the predictions mentioned above, you know that most of them actually proved out to be the fact, especially the ones that have been mentioned separately and many of those are made for future too, which only makes us believe that there is no end to these predictions as long as the earth is revolving. So this will be not at all fair to look up for the conclusion of all these things, as there is a lot that everyone has to look up for on this earth. <laughs>